Um, I think it's about time to start. So, what I've always loved about Rails is just how productive I feel when I'm using it. Um, before Rails, I spent a lot of time working in Python and Django, in PHP, in .NET, and all sorts of things. And I like lots of things about them, but nothing has ever come close to Rails as a framework language combination for being able to move so quickly from an idea to something that works, to a working version of that idea. And particularly when I'm working in Rails, I don't feel like I'm spending lots of time solving web development problems. I feel like I'm spending time solving the problems that relate to the thing that I'm building, the things that are unique to the problem that I'm trying to solve. And I've just never felt like that about mobile. I've spent time building native mobile applications um, in Java and Android. And while I quite like the languages, I think the tooling's very impressive, I've always spelt, uh, spelt, felt like I spent a very long time solving fairly standard mobile development problems fairly simple things like making API calls, like persisting data, things that I assume every other mobile developer has also solved, I feel like I spent an unusually large amount of time uh, trying to solve those myself. And if you add to that the fact that, realistically, if you're targeting native apps at iOS and Android and you have a web version, as soon as you start supporting all three platforms, for every feature you build, you probably need three developers to build it. And that's something I've always really pushed back on. That means I've always been the guy sitting at the back of the room in sprint planning saying, nope, I don't want to do native yet because that's going to mean a big hit to our productivity. And because of that, I've spent a lot of time over the last few years looking for magic bullets, which of course don't exist. I've spent time building HTML5 web applications and deploying them with PhoneGap and also trying to compile to native solutions such as Accelerator. And while both have a lot going for them, I've never managed to make a HTML5 web application that actually feels like a native application. It always feels like a, a web application that's been made a bit better on mobile. And the compiled to native frameworks, while impressive, for anything non-trivial, seem to degenerate quite quickly into if Android do this, if iOS do this, which is hard to test, it's hard to maintain, and loses a lot of the supposed benefits. And that's until about 18 months ago. About 18 months ago, uh, at Catapult, where I work, we started playing with React for our web applications. Um, and we made a lot of mistakes when we first started playing with React, but relatively quickly, over a few months, we got to a stack that we were quite happy with. We started in uh, converting small amounts of our front end to it, and very quickly we'd ported everything across. Now, Facebook um, sells or um, kind of puts React forward as as learn once, write anywhere, as opposed to write once, run anywhere. And I was kind of skeptical of this because I've just seen so much of this, if Android do this, if iOS do this type code for platforms that um, claim the same thing. But we were very pleasantly surprised when we started working in React. We found that almost everything that we learned building React applications for the web was applicable to React applications on mobile. If you try really hard, it's possible to make exactly the same mistakes on both platforms. Um, <laughs> But not only was what we learned architecturally relevant, we found that the libraries we were using in React Web, in a majority of cases, we could reuse those exact libraries on React Native. And that was brilliant, because that meant from a developer productivity point of view, any developer who could, write, who could work on our web code base could pretty much instantly get up to speed and start working on our mobile code base. And that was really exciting. And it's not a very big leap to go from, well, libraries are just other people's code, to why can't we then reuse our own code across platforms? And the point we started to get to is that a large, a large proportion of our business logic, um, so that the vast majority of our code, we can now share across um, completely native applications and our web applications. And the outcome of that, the reason I care about it so much, is that if we want to uh, create native applications and a completely separate web interface, rather than that being three times the effort to support three platforms, it's maybe plus 10% for each of the additional platforms we want to um, that we want to support. And as a result, I'm no longer the guy sitting at the back of the room going, don't want to do native yet because we're going to need three times as many developers to do it. Uh, so I'm Ben, by the way. Uh, I'm CTO of a company called Catapult, a staffing platform based in London. Um, I've spoken here a couple of times before, but it's always been about Docker or um, deploying servers. And while I count myself as a full stack developer, I'm generally much more comfortable setting up infrastructure or building APIs than I am doing front end development. Uh, I would much prefer if front end was essentially just bootstrap or at least up until I started working with React. And the reason I want to come and give this talk is because this React and React Native stack is the first time I've really felt that the tools, the tools that I had made me as productive building front-end applications uh, as I can be building Rails applications. So there are kind of three areas I want to cover, which I think we have enough time for. Um, one of them is just at a high level, what does a production React application look like? What are the components of that? Then in a little bit more detail, 
um, what, is it, what are the important considerations for that stack if our main aim is the a minimum uh, level of friction when sharing code between a web and a native code base. Then finally, at kind of the other end of the detail spectrum, I've just been looking back over, over the last 18 months, where did I waste the most time? What are the very small things that I spent a disproportionately large, of time try, large amount of time trying to work out? Um, and what, sort of the things I wish people had told me. And I'll just run through a few almost anecdotal bits uh, that I hope are useful to anyone who tries to pursue this, this path themselves. So the first uh, and really important thing is React is not a framework. It's not like something like Angular that includes pretty much everything you need uh, in order to build a front end or a, a JavaScript application. React is essentially a view layer. React provides us with a declarative model for defining components. We pass props into those components, so we pass data into those components, and React works out what needs to be rendered to display those components based on that input. So if we're building for the web, that will be React DOM, and it will be HTML that it's coming up with for us, and if we're building for native, that will be native components through React Native. But fundamentally, React doesn't provide any of the rest of the stuff. It doesn't provide a way to make API calls. It doesn't provide a way to deal with persistence. And that can be a little bit confusing when people talk about this is built in React. And what, of course, is meant by this is built in React is that React is being used as a view layer, and a collection of other libraries are being used to provide everything else. And as a Rails developer, I'm quite spoiled. I'm quite used to the fact that generally for any given component of the stack, if it's not provided by Rails, there is probably a community consensus on, oh, it's your first time doing it, just use this. In the JavaScript world, that tends not to be the case. It was, you should use this this week and probably this next week, and it's all very, very stressful and very tiring. Um, so what I'm gonna go over now is by no means the React stack. It's by no means, we're not suggesting it's the best one or the only one, but it's a stack that we've been very happy with. It's the one that I've probably seen most used across other large um, React code bases. And it's one that we found is very, very friendly if your main aim is to be able to share your code base across web and um, mobile with maximum reuse. So a typical React stack is going to need four main components. It's going to need a router. And a router's job in React terms is purely to take, for example, slash login in a browser and work out, based on this URL, which components need to be rendered. Similarly, in a native mobile application, it knows that you are on a login screen and it needs to work out which components need to be rendered to provide a login screen. Shockingly, in a talk about React, we're probably going to need some implementation of React. For the web, we're going to need React DOM, and for native, we're going to need React Native. State is a little bit more complicated. Now, as we said, React is not a framework. So there is no right way of managing global application state in React. There is no React way of doing it. Uh, that said, there are certain patterns that have been quite widely adopted across the community and patterns that we found to be very beneficial uh, and very uh, conducive to this code sharing, um, this, this code sharing approach. And you may have heard of them referred to as the flux pattern, uh, which is, I think, sort of kind of the original one or what popularized it, or you may have heard it referred to um, by the name of an implementation of that pattern. Uh, for example, Redux, which is my personal favorite of those implementations. And these patterns and these implementations are developed almost as a reaction to the fact in a modern JavaScript application, it can be really hard to answer the question, what is the current state of my app and how did we get there? If you imagine uh, in a, a typical JavaScript application now, you may well have a selection of models with getters and setters, and you may then have um, callbacks within the DOM, which are directly updating those models, and you'll probably kick off some API calls, which will also, when they return, update those models, and very, very quickly, we end up with quite complicated race conditions where it's unclear, well, was this updated by the button that I clicked first, or was it by the API call? And almost more importantly, it feels very non-deterministic. It feels like each time we do it, um, we can't get it, something different will happen. So we don't really know what our state was, and we definitely can't replicate that state. And so what something like Redux does is say, imagine that our state, the entire state of application, is represented by a single JavaScript object. In a traditional JavaScript application, what we might do if we want to change something in that state is just have a callback, someone clicks on something, and then we directly manipulate the contents of that object um, to reflect the, new, reflect the new values that we want. The problem there is that potentially lots of things are manipulating it at once, so it's unclear exactly what the value should be at any given time. Uh, when using something like Redux, uh, your state is immutable. The current application state can only be changed in one way. The only way to change the state is to dispatch what's called an action. And an action is a description of the change that you wish to make to the state. 
um, when that action is dispatched, you, you, sorry, you pass that action um, and the current state of the application into a function, and it's that function's job to work out what should the next state be and return a completely new object with that state in it. The rest of the application can subscribe to updates to this state so that the UI, for example, can respond accordingly, but it can't directly change the state. This means we have a very linear queue of changes. Everything that wants to make a change dispatches something, and they go through this process one by one. Um, there is some amazing tooling around this approach that allows us to step through that. So we can at any point get a completely deterministic answer to what is the current state of our application and how did it get there. And what's more, if we want to, we can rewind through that. We can step backwards through our state and understand what would our application have looked like at each of these states. It's worth looking at it a little bit of an example because this is quite core to the, the architecture that we've adopted. So here you have a very, very simple example. Imagine an app which is just one button and you press the button and it increments a counter. And the aim of the app, it's an amazing game, is to get the counter as high as possible. I've seen worse in the app store. Um, <laughs> and um, so here you can see labeled as initial state, the, the JavaScript object that represents our global state. It has a property count, which it begins as one. It has the name of our current user and their rank. In a traditional JavaScript application, if we want to update this count, we might have a callback for the button. And when that's clicked, it goes in and updates this object. If we're using Redux, we don't do this. What we do is dispatch the action at the bottom. The action is a very simple JavaScript object which has a type property, in this case increment, and a payload which in this case is increment by, but can be any combination of other JavaScript properties and objects. We then pass these two things, our application's current state um, and the action, into this reducer, this counter reducer. And that's a very simple switch. All it's doing is looking at the type of the action and then working out what changes need to be made to the state. But still, it doesn't change the state. It creates a new object, it merges in the existing state, and then makes any changes to this new object. It then returns this, um, this overall object, which is the new state of our application. The rest of our UI, for example, will have subscribed to changes to this, and then the next action, which is in the queue to be applied, will be applied to this new state. So we have a very simple, very linear way of modeling what our application state is. Finally, we're gonna need something to uh, manage side effects. And I found side effects as a term quite confusing just because I'd never heard it before. And it turns out that when people talk about side effects, I'm fairly sure we just mean asynchronous stuff. Um, so in the case of our counter app, imagine that because it's become very popular, we want to maintain leaderboards, we're no longer doing this just in the app. When you press that button, we want to kick off an API call, uh, which will then update the server um, and maybe get back the um, current leaderboard rank of our user. So in this case, you would have um, a library. Um, if I, when I'm working with Redux, I'll generally use something called Redux Saga for this. And this basically listens for actions being dispatched and then it kicks off um, something asynchronous. So in this case, it would be an API call. When that asynchronous action returns, it will then generally do something to handle it. Most of the time, that will be dispatching additional actions. For example, in this case, we might dispatch an action that updates the, lead, the rank value um, in our, new st in our uh, state um, to reflect the user's current rank. So those are sort of the four components that we'll end up with. And there'll be all sorts of other libraries, things for wrapping APIs, but architecturally, those are the four big components. And so we then have the question of what should be, sh or what should be shared and what can be shared between a web and a mobile code base. And it's quite important at this point that the reason I was interested in this originally wasn't because I wanted a way to make HTML5 versions of native applications. I haven't come across very many production applications where the web version is just a scaled up version of the um, mobile version. So one of my assumptions going into this is that the, the view layer of a, keep doing that, the view layer of a, mobile app, of a mobile application will probably be very, very different to the view layer of a web application. That can be anything from the fact that forms, which are only one screen on a web application, may well be three, four, five screens on mobile, to the fact that the entire structure of the application may be different. I'd kind of liken this to, if we're working in Rails, if we build a web application and want to add a JSON API, roughly what we expect that to look at is all of our business logic will be sitting in our uh, fat models or possibly these days in our service objects, and then we'll have some skinny controllers, some routing, and some views which take care of the actual display of that data. We would never consider having a single view for our JSON API and our, uh, our HTML web view um, because that would be full of if JSON view then this, if web then this, and they're just very different things. And I've generally found applying the same approach to sharing code here makes a lot of sense. 
And that roughly means that the routing and the actual components, the view layer, um, aren't shared. But the management of state, so how does the state of our application change when, when particular actions occur, and the management of side effects, so things like API calls, can all be shared very easily. And the, the bits in green at the bottom tend to make up the vast majority of the code base. So the benefits and efficiency from sharing them are quite large. It's worth having a look at a practical example, so in pretty much any application will have some sort of login page. So to begin with, we're going to go to a login page, our router, which will determine what components to display, and then we're going to have the view layer that displays them, and these won't be shared. They could be very different on web and mobile. However, when you click the login button, it doesn't really matter what your platform is. Something quite similar is going to be happening. We're gonna to want to dispatch an action to update our application's global state. At the very least, we're probably gonna to want to update some sort of flag which says that we are currently trying to log in. That way, whatever UI we have can listen for this flag, and if it's true, then display some sort of loading or progress spinner. And hopefully, at the same time, we're also going to dispatch something asynchronous, an API call to actually log the user in. So we're gonna have a side effect that's listening for that login action that then kicks off this API call. This API call is gonna go off to the server and come back. So that side effect's going to wait and it's gonna listen for a successful response or a failed response and have paths for handling each. And when we get our successful response, at the very least, we're going to want to update our state to say, we are no longer trying to log in. So that progress spinner can be hidden. What's more, we're probably gonna to wanna to store some extra data. We're probably gonna to wanna to store a login token, for example, maybe some profile data about the user. And then ideally, we're not gonna leave them on the login page. We're gonna redirect them to a dashboard or a home page or a terrible game with account involving a counter. Um, and so the simplest way to do this is we then have our side effect issue a redirect to our router, and our router then sends them to the new page. And this is the bit that looks really simple, but it all starts to crumble and fall apart. Cool. Intentional, but it worked really well. Um, so this is where it all starts to crumble and fall apart. Um, because what we have here is a side effect which we said is shared. It doesn't matter what platform we're on, we're always going to want to have something that happens after login. But this side effect is now talking to our router, which we said is non-shared. So either this side effect is going to have, some, have to have some sort of if web do this, if mobile do this in it, or we're going to have to stop sharing this side effect. So we really don't want to do this. And as is often the case in the JavaScript world, it turns out the solution to this is callbacks. And what we actually want to do is if we go all the way back to the start um, of this login flow, when we click that login button, the component containing the login button will, con will also define callback functions. It will define on success and on failure. And recall that that's a non-shared component. Our view, component, our, our view layer is non-shared. So it's fine for our component to know about the router, to know how the router works and to know where someone should be directed afterwards. All the side effect has to know is that callbacks will be passed in and they will correspond to a given interface, i.e. what parameters to pass in. Then our side effect is completely shareable and our callbacks are sort of retained, they're encapsulated within our non-shared logic. And so hopefully what this sh shows is that in the same way we end up with, a, we, with shared business logic by including it in models or service objects in Rails, by following something like this approach where we um, share our actions and reducers and our side effects, and we don't share our router and our components, we end up with something that's actually a lot like building a regular React application. And this has been really important because we found as long as we follow this um, pattern, we're using the same libraries for native and for, um, for web, and so a developer who can work on one is pretty much instantly productive in the other one. Um, now, the bit of this slide I really don't like, but it seems disingenuous not to include it, is in my head this is very, or ideally this would be very, very clean. Side effects are always shared and view layers are always not shared. And as you can see, we have this very artfully kind of faded out side effects bit that goes in the non-shared category. Um, because actually there's one particular area where there will definitely be side effects that you choose not to share. And there's a sample app I'll share at the end which has an example of this, and that's generally uh, native, uh, native functionality of the device. I'm talking about things like uh, if you want to interact with a GPS, you clearly have asynchronous behaviors there, which is the device's GPS returning new coordinates, and it takes a lot of contortion to come up with a way that that should be shared between two platforms, because you're never gonna need that on web. And I wasted quite a lot of time when I started doing this trying to be overly purist about it and make sure that this was actually done in a component that was passed to this pseudo-shared um, side effect. And the only reason this is really important um, at this point in the talk is that this makes quite a big difference to how you structure the overall application, because one approach is to structure it in such a way that all of the code that glues the libraries together and says which side effects and which um, reduces and which actions are loaded, 
Uh, one approach is to have that, that as standardized and then make exceptions to it. And the other approach is to have web and native define that setup behavior explicitly, which makes it very easy to add these exceptions in when you want to. And that will probably make a lot more sense if you look at the example code at the end. Um, but if you choose one approach, changing to the other one is something of a pain. So it's worth designing for that uh, from the very beginning. And that pretty much covers sort of architecturally what I found uh, works. And we found that this is generally quite a productive environment to work in. It's quite a simple environment to work in. Um, importantly, pretty much all of the, if you're following a tutorial for React Web, uh, and there are far more of those at the moment because React Web's been popular for much longer, generally it will all be completely applicable to React Native as well. Uh, and this makes the experience of working on, of working on this very, very simple. Um, you'll find that less so with React Native, because anything device um, specific obviously won't apply to, to the web. But in general, this is just like working on a regular React application. There's nothing particularly special about it. And that kind of covers the sort of architectural side and, what we've, and how we found sharing works. And so the rest of this is mainly about um, the bits that I kind of really messed up early on, the bits, bits where I wasted a lot of time. The first one is that we are building native applications here. That means that we do need an Xcode project. We do need a uh, Gradle file. We do need Objective-C code. We do need Java code. And happily, React Native includes a CLI which generates all of this for us very, very efficiently. Um, now, what React Native um, will generate is quite minimal, but it definitely works. Uh, and because I never want to try and retrofit uh, a React Native into a web project again, even if I'm making a web project, if I think there's any chance I'll want to build a native version, I'll start by generating the native version just so all of that boilerplate is there and then add the web bit afterwards. Now, the built-in CLI generator is fine, but very minimal. It's completely non-opinionated. It is the bare minimum code you need for a React Native app. Um, as a Rails developer, I don't really, really have an aversion to writing boilerplate. I really don't like it. And there's a fantastic generator by the guys at Infinite Red um, called Ignite. Now, the Ignite generator is just a layer on top of the, re um, the regular React CLI. Uh, so you don't need to worry that it's introducing additional dependency. It's not something where if it goes away, it will cause problems for your app. All it's doing is generating a load of boilerplate. So you run the Ignite generator, and if you remember the four components from earlier on, it will take some of the most popular libraries from those, it will set them up, and set up all the boilerplate that links it for you. This is not a good reason to use something, but it also generates an app folder, which as a Rails developer makes me feel far more comfortable. Um, because everything is in an app folder. Um, that app folder will probably look relatively f familiar. You have in there subfolders for things like sagas, which is for our side effects, uh, for Redux, which is for our state management, for components, which is for components, really. Um, and the first thing I'll do is refactor those into three subfolders. The only reason that's actually worth its own slide is because something you may want to do quite early on is take your shared code and turn it into an NPM package. And if you've done this from the very start, it's pretty much trivial to pull that shared code out into an NPM package because all your file files will already be relative, everything will already be properly namespaced, uh, and that process will take a few hours rather than a couple of days if you're having to unwind this from multiple other places. The final one, which ended up taking an awful lot of time, um, way more time than I like to think about, really, um, is Babel RC. Um, now, Babel is a, or Babel can be used to transpile more modern uh, dialects of JavaScript, like ES6, into um, forms of JavaScript which are compatible with much older browsers. So if you've used React Web before, you've almost certainly will have come across Babel for this process. And if you're working with React for Web, the standard way of configuring uh, Babel is a Babel RC file in the root of the project. And the, in here, you define what transformations should be applied to your JavaScript and in what order. It turns out order is really, really important. Um, now, React Native doesn't use a Babel RC file. It, has, uh, it does use Babel, um, but it has its definitions baked into it. A workflow I discovered um, in a very painful way is extremely possible is you will then add a Babel RC file to the root of the project to configure the web, the web side of the project. React Native, if it sees a Babel RC file in the root of a, the root of a project, uh, will then use that Babel RC file to the exclusion of all its own configuration. So far, so, go, so good. There are lots of um, tutorials that explain how to set up a Babel RC file um, for use with React Native. The problem comes because React Native um, has a packager which caches incredibly aggressively. Uh, this is to make, so that when you make a change to one file, you don't have to go through and retranspile everything in node modules, essentially. 
Now, what it's very easy to do is you make a change to your Babel RC file, you test it on web, you test it on mobile, everything works brilliantly. You commit your feature and move on, and days or weeks or hours, whatever, pass. Um, and then something happens which invalidates this cache, and you will suddenly get the most unintuitive error messages you will ever encounter. My current favorite is type error. No other words on the screen, just type error in white on a red background. It looked like a meme of some sort. Um, <laughs> And so then you do what any responsible developer does. You step backwards through your commits to ones that you knew were working so that everything starts working again. But of course, nothing does start working again because the change to Babel RC occurred a week, two weeks, three weeks ago. Um, and eventually, you consider just scrapping the whole thing and becoming a plumber or a carpenter or something that doesn't involve working with JavaScript. Um, <laughs> And the solution is painfully simple. Whenever you make a change to Babel RC, start the React package manager with hyphen hyphen reset cache. Then it will break immediately and you will know that your problems occurred due to the changes to your Babel RC file. True story. Um, now hopefully what I've kind of covered here is the, the higher level architectural stuff in terms of what it makes sense to share, how you can share it, uh, and hopefully kind of um, got across that there are some really, there are some very real productivity gains that we're seeing from this. The reason I was so excited to talk about it is this has completely changed at what stage in a project. I now think it makes sense to start supporting native applications because I now don't see supporting both web and native as something that is suddenly going to require either a big drop in velocity of features or to hire a lot more developers. And to me, that's a really big change. Um, what I can't really cover in this talk is the kind of detail of how you glue all these libraries together and what that sharing actually looks like. So what I've done is put a sample project up at talkingquickly.co.uk forward slash railsconf2017. This is a personal project that I've been playing with for a few months. It's a little geologger, so you walk around different countries and it tells you where you've been and shows it on maps. Uh, but the important thing is it um, demonstrates what this sharing looks like in, in practice. Um, and the, both the iOS and web bits are open source, uh, as is the Rails API server behind it. So you can get a completely functioning app up and running and play around and see which bits of this approach you like and which bits you don't. Um, that's pretty much everything. Um, before we go on to questions, um, so uh, we at Catapult, we're based in London. We are, of course, hiring. If you think this stuff is interesting, um, please drop me an email. I'm ben at joincatapult.com or grab me here and get a coffee. Um, we're in London, but most of the product team is remote. Um, and yeah, come and chat. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, this was really good fun. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, absolutely. So a question if anyone didn't get it is when you're um, structuring actions, is there a way that you need to restructure it um, when they restructure it from a single file if they get particularly big? Um, yes is the short one. So I'm a big fan. So Redux and a library called Redux Source, which is basically some nice um, syntactic sugar on top of Redux. And that pretty much provides a framework for having um, multiple, um, multiple reducer files and then ensuring that, so if we go back to that one, you can have 10 or 15 or 20 files containing these functions, and it takes care of making sure that when an action comes in, it passes it to every single one of those in sequence. Uh, so you can break this code up and make it very, very modular. Does that sort of? Yeah, great question. So it's if, if you do actually need a responsive or sort of a mobile interface um, for the web version, then what you do there, is that, is that right? Yeah, so having said I wasn't originally interested in um, making HTML5 versions of that, that's actually the exact problem I have at the moment, because it turns out we also do need a HTML5 version of our web application, which is upsetting. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so two approaches, um, and I, I'm playing with both of them at the moment, so I, I'm not sure which is the best one. The simplest one uh, we found is, um, because we tend to use um, Bootstrap as the basis for everything, it's been very easy to convert our web interface to be uh, a responsive mobile app. There is also a new framework from Microsoft. Microsoft doing loads of really, really cool React stuff, which wasn't something I would have expected a year ago. Um, and they're working on a library which actually allows, which is intended um, to be an abstraction layer on top of React, uh, which allows you to um, define components and then have it work out what component would this be for web and what component would this be for mobile. So if that's what you really want to do, if you're prepared to um, lose a little bit of flexibility in terms of what native components and what web components you can use, that may be a solution um, to that. Uh, I haven't used it and I also can't remember the name of it, but if you Google uh, Microsoft React cross-platform, it will definitely come up. Yeah, so the question was, how do you manage keep it, when iOS and Android have very different components, how do you manage keeping them separate? Um, the honest answer for a majority of stuff is that I try not to. Um, generally, uh, I haven't come across many, um, React does quite a good job of working out, given the React component, what the native component should be, and providing a common interface across it. 
and I'm incredibly skeptical of things doing that because everything else that I've tried that has never really worked. So far, React has worked quite well. Um, so I don't think we have any production code at the moment where we've got switches for display something different for iOS and Android um, because generally the React defaults for how to display this particular control type on each platform and how to use the, the native components on that platform has been good enough for us. So not something we've had to deal with yet, happily. <laughs> oh, that's a great question. So what's the productivity of server-side, of standard sort of, not in a bad way, old-fashioned server-side Rails versus the kind of this client-side JavaScript application? Um, honestly, I've never found anything that I'm as productive in as making a server-side Rails app. So if I want to make something incredibly quickly, uh, Rails plus Haml, I just find that incredibly fast. I think what we found with this is once you get sort of a few months in, so it, it's beyond sort of the simplest application, um, those diff it, that, it's actually swung the other way. So it's far quicker to build the first version in, um, in server-side Rails. Um, but having this very clean separation of the API server and then the front-end application has actually been far more maintainable, and it's been far easier to do in a maintainable fashion. Um, so I think for larger projects, I would actually, I never thought I'd say this, I would tend now towards Rails as the API server um, and um, so, sort of some variation of this stack as the front-end, and that's because after two or three months, I'd probably expect to be more productive in this version than in the server-rendered version. How much iOS and Android do you need to know to start with React Native? Absolutely none. Uh, it is, I was super impressed, even without sort of the Ignite generator and so on. You download React CLI, um, you will have to follow some of the getting started stuff for um, sort of Xcode projects and Android projects, just installing the SDKs, but it actually did just work. And I never believe it when someone says it just works in the context of mobile development. Um, but it really did. It sort of generated a project, ran the command, and it was up and running in a simulator. So you don't need to know anything. Yeah, great question. So is, is, it, is there any element of web view to this, or is it native UI components? It's all native UI components. There is no, there's no web view, there's no HTML5 magic going on. Um, anything, any component that can be used in React Native uh, will generally map, or does map, to uh, native components. Uh, and so does have the corresponding feel and generally um, the corresponding performance. And co of course, sort of corresponding performance for the standard applications that are displaying lists of things and taking data in, uh, I'm sure it, it, sort of, it wouldn't be suitable for making games. But for most typical applications that are just taking information in and putting information out, uh, it will be providing completely native components at pretty much native performance. Uh, any pain points working with React Native? I want to be really glib and say Android, but that's really unfair. Um, <laughs> um, but yes, actually Android to an extent. Um, <laughs> not because React Native is any worse on Android, but just because the development process is a bit different. Um, because Pretty much, if it works on one iOS device, it works everywhere. If it works on one Android device, it definitely doesn't work everywhere because they're significantly different. So, sort of, um, you know, automated testing and that sort of thing we found are very reliable ways of identifying bugs in um, iOS applications and in the majority of Android applications. But you can't get away from the fact you need that extra layer of testing across Android devices with different capabilities. Cool. Um, so, what, what's the strategy where you want to do a lot, an awful lot of customization of the UI? Uh, I think almost two levels to that. One is that increasingly I found when you look at a lot of the very custom components, they're actually just quite heavily styled, and generally React is quite good at doing that. Um, so you can get quite a long way like that. Um, if you reach a point where um, you actually need to write a completely custom control for that platform, um, this is something I've only really done once, um, sort of I'm a long way from an Objective-C or a Java expert, um, but the program, for the, um, program, the process for developing native plugins is relatively simple. Um, and for making sure you do that in a reusable way and making them testable. Um, so it, it's fairly easy to do if you have to do that, but it's not something I have a massive amount of experience with. Um, thank you. Sure, so um, any experience working with the native wrappers for TurboLynx? Um, and what was that like working um, with, um, what, how does that compare to working with React? Um, I've used them in test projects to try them myself. I've never used them in production, so probably take anything I say with a big pinch of salt. I was quite impressed with them. Um, what bothered me about them, and the reason I've shied away from using them in production, is they just seem very, very niche. Um, there, isn't a there aren't a huge number of people with experience using them. So just, uh, just from a selfish point of view, in terms of attracting developers, there are, seem to be an awful lot of developers out there who really want to work with React and React Native, and far fewer who want to work with TurboLynx, because it's seen as some, or TurboLynx um, Native, um, just because it's seen as something that it's not necessarily clear how in demand that skill's going to be in two, three, four, five years' time. Uh, so it's not something I've been particularly keen to put into production. 
Cool. Uh, if that's everything, thank you very much. Yeah.